there's a major Titanic development here in Washington, the decision to send some dozen, two dozen or so M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine on the battlefield in conjunction with Poland, with Finland, and with Germany, and the uh, departure of tanks from all of these Western nations to try and help Ukraine in its offensive in the coming months. President Biden making this announcement. Let's take a listen. Putin expected Europe and the United States to weaken our resolve. He expected our support for Ukraine to crumble with time. He was wrong. He was wrong. And he was wrong from the beginning, and he continues to be wrong. We are united. America's united, and so is the world. And we approach the one-year mark, as we do, of the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We remain united and determined, as ever, in our conviction and our cause. These tanks are further evidence of our enduring, unflagging commitment to Ukraine and our confidence in the skill of the Ukrainian forces. This is an important decision marker. It was one that was never contemplated by the Pentagon, by the Biden administration, and by Western officials, which changed all within the last month. So let's go all the way back. So first, President Zelensky visits here in Washington. One of the two main asks that he asked President Biden, number one, was not just Patriot missile system, but more Patriot missile systems. Number two is tanks and jets. Now, jets are off the table for now, but listen to this story because the tanks were completely off the table. Then what happens is that Poland Poland has in possession some leopard tanks that were given to it by Germany. Poland says, I want to give these tanks to Ukraine because of repeated requests by President Zelensky. Well, then what happens? What they have to go to Germany because Germany is the one who gave them the tanks. Germany says, no, we're not going to give you those tanks uh, because then the decision is on us to allow Poland to do it. Ch Chancellor Olaf Scholz says, the only way I'm giving these tanks to Ukraine is if you give tanks to Ukraine, because then it's a complete NATO decision, especially right. led by the United States, and not one that lands in Germany, because Germany doesn't want to be the one that is retaliated against by Russia if such an attack yes. were to happen. They don't want to be out there on their own, just right. not to, to cut you short, right. but just to insert a little piece here. This is yeah. from Politico's reporting about behind the scenes negotiations. This should make everybody very uncomfortable. Schultz was, Schultz was adamant in his discussions with Biden that supplying left for tanks to Ukraine marks such a qualitatively new step <laughs> that the U.S. as the world's biggest military power, but also Germany's guarantee for nuclear deterrence must be involved. They also want to demonstrate unity toward Putin. Important to the chancellor from the very beginning that we take every step with as much unity as possible, as spokesperson said. So yeah. they're basically like, listen, we don't feel like our nuclear deterrence is enough. <laughs> we want the world's superpower yes. on our I mean, that's how provocative. Right. They ultimately view this step and they'd really come to loggerheads because um, they're, the military, in particular the Pentagon, really did not want to send these tanks. Mm -hmm. And they put out there like, oh, it's because it's hard to train on whatever. No, they saw this as a uh, significant escalation. They also worry about our own you know, readiness, as we've been talking about should. as well. Yeah. Biden was reluctant. And effectively, Germany was under pressure and there was starting to be this ugly split in the NATO alliance. And Biden just caved and was like, all right, fine. Rather than have any demonstration of disunity, we're just going to go along with right. sending these tanks. Something that they had completely ruled out early in this conflict, because remember, it's easy to like lose track of how these things all started. The original thought and the original what was sold to the American people, we will provide them whatever they need for the, their defense. Mm -hmm. Tanks are a strictly offensive capability. So this was previously like, you know, completely out of bounds and now here we are. Well, the reason it also matters is the offensive itself. What is that offensive going to look like? Where you can combine that with some reporting that we brought to you all just a couple of weeks ago about the U.S. is warming to the idea of Ukraine taking back Crimea. Now, look, I have no idea whether they even have that capability. And on the tank piece, it's important. So I asked some of my friends uh, who work in the defense industry, and I was like, all right, what's actually the deal with these tanks? And they're like, look, we don't actually even know the detail of the tank itself. The tank itself is a platform. There's a lot of technology that goes into the U.S. tank. Uh, there's in terms of the ones that we sell, we sell them all over the world. Some of them are from the 1980s. Some of them, you wouldn't like a 2023 Abrams tank versus a 1980s tank, the 2023 one is going to win every day, even though they look kind of similar. So the point is, is that that's actually unclear. Mm. Uh, they need to be specially manufactured in the next couple of months by the U.S. defense industry. So congratulations to the uh, uh, makers here in Northern Virginia uh, mm -hmm. who are going to be <laughs> supplying those tanks. So they're specially manufactured for Ukraine. They need to be trained on it. There's an entire logistical pattern 
pattern that needs to develop in order to supply and keep up these tanks are, you know, in general, pretty advanced uh, pieces of technology. So that's uh, a piece of it. However, uh, it was immediately noticed by Russia. Let's put this up there on the screen. Uh, the city of Kiev immediately under bombardment uh, that happened right after Kiev secured the tanks. And the reason here is that the U.S. and Germany are sending these tanks immediately after this decision was made. The strike happened on Kiev. So when we put those two things together, clearly the Russians see it as something. Now, how exactly are they going to respond? We genuinely have no idea. I actually saw a really troubling headline this morning in the New York Times. Uh, it says that the Ukraine war, or it says, here's how President Biden reluctantly agreed to send tanks to Ukraine. But let me read you guys the subhead. It was just this morning. The decision unlocked a flow of heavy arms from Europe and inched the United States and its NATO allies closer to direct conflict with Russia. That is a That is literally that's not me war scaremongering or whatever. That's from the Times, probably one of the most hawkish outlets in this entire conflict. It also comes on the heels of uh, the doomsday clock, the famous clock about how close we are supposedly to uh, nuclear war. Let's go ahead and put this video up on the screen. I can speak over it from the Bureau of Atomic Scientists. They now say we are set 100 seconds, or sorry, 90 seconds to midnight, which is the closest to uh, catastrophe that we have ever been in the history of the B B Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, calling it, quote, a global catastrophe. Look, all we're, try we're, we have we're trying to approach this in a very level-headed way and not be skeptical. I'm even trying not to let my bias come in here when it's Germany, and I'm like, yeah, why don't you send them the tanks? I'm like, you're the one who's only like a couple hundred miles from there. Uh, it's your country, your continent. Why do we have to be the ones to do it? The reason why I think that this is significant and was regarded as such by President Biden, by General Mark Milley, by the Navy Secretary, who said that we're gonna have to start cannibalizing our own supplies if we continue to have to uh, supply Ukraine, is that this could change the entire ballgame on the battlefield. Because look at what happened with Russia. Russia's armored carriers and all this, everything is breaking down. Their global infrastructure, or their infrastructure, military supply chain, disaster. That's why they're so reliant on railroads like it's World War II. They don't have the upkeep. Ukraine capturing many of these things, and it was one of the ways that they were able to cripple the Russian offensive in the first place. Well, now, if they have sophisticated Western technology that can outmatch Russia on the battlefield, we're not talking just about breakthroughs, but you don't know where that's going to stop. And let's say that it stops in Crimea. Now what? We're actually in a completely different strategic situation. I'm not even saying I think Russia well, should have Crimea, but what we're saying is they think they should have Crimea, and they have nukes. So what does that mean? Now, according to the Times, President Biden and his advisors believe that the the risk of the tactical nuclear weapon being used in Ukraine has gone down. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, you know, the risk of everything seems to go down until it goes way up yeah. whenever the strategic situation changes. Right. Yeah. I mean, their their logic here seems to be like, well, they haven't nuked us yet, yeah. so should be fine. Like, I guess they're just not going to. And I do think that's a real myth, the idea that Russia has not escalated in response to some of the actions that we have taken with regard to Ukraine. They did escalate. Now, they didn't escalate to nuclear war yet, right. uh, but they did escalate in terms of going back to attacking Kyiv, going to attacking the energy infrastructure to try to make this winter as brutal and painful as Ukrainians as they possibly can. Um, so, you know, they ultimately went forward with the draft, and there's rumors that they may do another round of conscription domestically. So I think even this mythology that Russia didn't respond, that there was no escalation, is just factually inaccurate. And it also, as I said before, it reminds me of some of the conversations that came out in the WikiLeaks cables that were revealed by uh, Bronco Marsatic. He talked about how there were a lot of people who said, oh, the Russians always say that about Ukraine mm. and NATO, and they never really do anything. So the fact that they didn't act instantly was taken as proof that like, ah, they're all bluster, they're not yes. ultimately gonna move forward. That turned out to not be correct. In reality, it was a red line for them. In a reality, in reality, and this again, onus and burden and culpability fully on Putin and the Kremlin, et cetera. But they had drawn a red line, we ignored it, and that is part of the context of how we ended up ultimately in this place. And I just see a lot of echoes of, of that here and the last thing that I'll, I'll put in here is, you know, a lot of what they're trying to sell to the press is like, oh, well, this was all about unity with NATO and unity with Germany. And you heard that in the president's comments. There was a line, though, in that Politico piece that just came out of the like inside story or whatever that really stuck out to me, too, because part of the debate 
before they decided whether or not to send these tanks was about the capability of the tanks, if it really made yep. sense in this context, some of the drawbacks of this particular type of tank. And apparently, according to Politico, you'll love this, those comments frustrated defense industry executives who felt the Pentagon was making disparaging remarks about U.S. manufactured equipment. Weeks before, Laura Cooper, a Pentagon official charged with overseeing Ukraine policy, had called the Abrams tanks a gas guzzler. The U.S. does not have to advocate for sending the Abrams, one industry insider said, but administration officials shouldn't criticize the tank. That's especially true since another country in the region, Poland, is buying M1s from General Dynamics. Other countries like Morocco, Iraq, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt have purchased export versions of the tank as well. So they were also deeply concerned that this was impacting their bottom line and ability to sell weapons around the world. So they're putting pressure on the administration to make this decision from their own bottom line perspective as what well. One of the reasons why I think this is, again, is so important is they don't know how to make these tanks. They don't know how to do anything. And they don't have the money to buy them. That means that we're on the hook forever. Like a real nation, whenever it mounts a defense, it has an industrial base, it has an economy, it has a populace that is capable of mounting that singular defense, sometimes with allies, but not wholly reliant on them, in order to mount it and defend its sovereignty. U Ukraine has none of that. I mean, they would not, they wouldn't even deny it. Without NATO and the Western countries, they fail to exist in a single moment. If we cut them off on ammunition, it, they're dead. It's over. And so when does it end? Like, what does the actual end period point. look? Because this, even if they push Russia out- what are they going to do? Then they'll yeah. say, if you don't continue to give right. us all these things, then they're just going to come back. Yeah. So what are we on the hook for 50, 100 billion a year for every single year going forward? And I really cannot let the Europeans off the hook. This is Libya all over again. They're the ones who, dra and the, I'm, I'm quoting Susan Rice, who herself was a, a complete hawk, who said to, this is all in the transcript, you're not going to drag us into your shitty war in Libya. They didn't, Obama did not want to go into Libya. It's the Germans and the French who were like, no, we got to do it for human rights, all this stuff. Oh, look at Benghazi, Gaddafi, all this. And then now what's happening in Libya right now? There are literal slave markets uh, that are over there in the entire, ask the people uh, who live in uh, literal like anarchy, whether they prefer then or now. I'm not saying Gaddafi was a good guy, but the point is like, should we have been the ones who determined exactly what was going on there? It's all during the promise of the Arab Spring. It was only 10, what, 10 years ago yeah. uh, that that happened. Like, how do we have collective amnesia. And I think it should scare everybody that they were not willing to do it without the burden on us because, listen, we're all in it now. Uh, and we don't have any say. There's, and this is also why I was always advocating for the Congress to step up to its constitutional responsibility and to write strategic provisions in the arms that are given to Ukraine and define the exact platforms the and the, yeah. take it out of the executive hand. Biden is an 80-year-old man. He could drop dead tomorrow. The policy of the United States then is all in the hands of Kamala Harris. Are we comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with that? Like, take away even the nuke button. Look at this. This is the extraordinary amount of responsibility that they have abdicated. I think it's really important. And again, let's throw this next one up on the screen. Uh, it just shows you that this was just a couple days ago. Top U.S. officials don't want to give Ukraine tanks despite German pressure. Five days ago. That's how quickly that we fold. Um, and it shows you the power of the Ukraine lobby here in the United States. Yeah. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.